Hello there, California scholars. Hope all is going well with you and hope this is working. All right, um, gonna talk about land and uh, with the United States takeover. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about Indians at a, on the next video after this. And so, so land and um, Indians. And uh, here again, we begin with this gold rush. This gold rush is very problematic. We tend to praise it. Brings in a lot of colonization, which is bad colonization, causes a lot of chaos and very, very destructive of the Indians in, uh, in general. Bringing in a class of people that were not family oriented. We're not, you know, uh, trying to build lives here of goodness, but instead we're coming here to great, get wealth and then uh, quite often to just head out and go home. So basically use up the land and go. Big problem in California is how we grow, what kind of people we grow with. So, uh, you know, we uh, uh, had some good models. This was, um, I mentioned this guy in the last one, it is when the, uh, when the Navy came, the Navy had some good lieutenants, you know, on board these ships who were uh, under martial law. San Francisco gives in, and then this guy, uh, uh, Bartlett, is then put in charge of running San Francisco. Did a good job, wanted to actually help establish San Francisco for the future. And so this young lieutenant does good work. In Monterey, you had this guy, uh, Colton. And this is Colton Hall, you can go visit in Monterey still. Came in, get the newspaper going, get the schools going, get, the, get this building built, the Constitution in 1850 will be done in there. And, you know, serving as a, a real good example of trying to bring in New Englander, Connecticut, you know, type of guy, bringing in uh, values, and uh, he doesn't stay. Uh, but the uh, but the idea of he he really wants to do a good job. So the Navy Navy actually really helpful. Uh, then of course we talked about these coast mappers last time. And they're, they're the ones that I would really emphasize if you're gonna talk about the people who really built up California and, uh, and the kind of people who were, were good. Davidson remained here and continued on uh, in San Francisco. You have Mount Davidson, and then you have, um, he built an observatory there, and what is, I think, now Golden Gate Park. And then eventually, at the end of his life, uh, I think he's given a position at, uh, I've read biographies of him long ago, yeah, I think he's given position at, uh, at UC uh, Berkeley as a, uh, as a uh, geology professor or something like that. But um, he is a long-standing, you know, one of the great figures of early California. So Davidson, people like that, rather than, you know, some of the more rowdy stories, which we love to tell. Um, this is uh, Josiah Whitney. And the uh, Whitney survey, Whitney was at UC Berkeley and, and uh, was, stayed here and uh, led the, led the, uh, the land survey. Uh, Davidson did the coast, the topography of the coast uh, with the coast survey, but then you have a land survey. And you have several people who work with them that are, are uh, these are the guys who actually get out and do the work. They, they are up and down California, climbing especially. So you get Mount Whitney, uh, this, this group names Mount Whitney the highest point in uh, the continental 48 states. And then this is Brewer, and Brewer and King, this is Clarence King. Uh, Cotter and Gardner are these guys, but they're, uh, you know, all these guys get mountains named after them. They name them after each other, and, and uh, that's, that's the legacy of these guys. But here again, uh, U.S. government service people uh, coming out of high schools, knowing their mathematics, doing their surveying really well, coming out here and uh, dedicating themselves to the good hard work of mapping, uh, laying out, figuring out what is out here, so especially that the railroads and other things can develop here in California. So the Whitney survey, you know, I think deserves its honor. This is Clarence King. He's one of the wild men of, Cal of United States history. And uh, this is, he's probably like a foot off of the ground here. <laughs> he's quite the showman. Writes a great book about the Sierra Nevada. Goes on to become the head of the uh, U.S. Geological Survey. Great friend of John Hay, one of the great secretaries of state of American history. And also um, uh, Henry Adams, you know, the Hay Adams Hotel in Washington, D.C. Just a fascinating guy. Fascinating guy. Sort of a, 
big promoter of, of himself, but you know, also just fascinating. We have then also uh, border surveys down in the south. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you live up on Highway 101 going into San Francisco around Redwood City, uh, you have uh, Whipple Avenue. And here's, uh, here's Whipple himself, was this leader. And we're going to talk about Coots. Coots is on the survey, works on it for several years, and um, he's one of the bad guys. Uh, and uh, one of the folks that we just do not want to honor. But we'll talk about him under the Indians. Now, uh, when the, one of the things we always forget, or a lot of people forget, is we're under martial law. And uh, military, this is always the military's job. And you go into Iraq, you go into Japan, you go into wherever. We, we have a temporary conquering situation in which the military leadership has to take on the role of making things work, you know, building schools and roads and making sure the water flows and, you know, just all sorts of things that the military does rather than just conquer. And, uh, and so you just have to keep that in mind. Keep always, the military have done so much good. And the military do a lot of good in California. We have these very short-term people. If you're in San Francisco, there's a Mason Street named after Mason. Mason uh, deals in, we're going to talk about him with the Indians, and he makes the declaration. He decides under military law that we're going to bring in United States policy toward Indian land and Indians rather than uh, follow the uh, uh, Mexican or Spanish model, and that'll be a big problem. But it's Bennett Riley calls for a, a constitution to be written uh, here because the uh, gold rush has brought in a large population. Now, this is uh, the Compromise of 1850. This is the United States. And we're going to jump here to this basically California's effect on the, on the coming of the Civil War. Uh, California needs to come in, we have the population, it needs to come in as a free state. There's no other state to balance. In 1820, we had a compromise in 1820, which said that, you know, we're basically going to do South and North and keep them balanced. Uh, the House of Representatives, uh, population is more in the North, than the South, so the House of Representatives will not be balanced, and yeah, that'll be, you know, the North controls the House of Representatives. But the Senate would be balanced. There's two senators from each state, and they'd be balanced, and then therefore they could hold a sort of uh, tight rope on, uh, on uh, keeping slavery in the country. Uh, the vice president and president then had to be pro-slavery or certainly not going to be against slavery. And then in 1850, California comes in and has to be allowed in. And so there's this thing called the Com Compromise of 1850 in which the Senate goes out of balance. And so now you have the House of Representatives and the Senate, which are both controlled or dominated by the North, the free state parties. Uh, what the South gets out of that is the uh, fugitive slave law. Uh, fugitive slave law is what causes, you know, Harry Tubman stories, lots of fun American history, lots of dynamic heroes, you know, fighting the fugitive slave law and stuff like that. Richard Henry Dana will be a fighter of the, against the fugitive slave law up in Massachusetts. So, so we've got a lot of interesting stuff that happens because California becomes a state. Basically, California pushes the Civil War to happen, and uh, and then. Um, you know, it will, it will blow up. But this isn't a, a Civil War class, this isn't a United States class. What happens in California is of our interest, is that um, with statehood and the coming of statehood, there becomes this whole interest in a, a, a new capital. You know, basically the geographical center of power moves, and it moves up from Monterey Bay here into uh, this river network here that leads into San Francisco Bay. Uh, this is where most all of the population is going. And the, initially, Venetia, Martinez, this area right here, was going to be the thought, you know, they had made a <laughs> Mariano Vallejo, and, and this guy Semple had made a, made a leap into trying to get the a, uh, capital to be there. It was a land sort of move. Uh, this was uh, Vallejo's uh, property up uh, up to north of the uh, of the bay, and um, he 
Venetia is named after uh, Vallejo's wife, which is a, a Carrillo, uh, part of the big Carrillo family. So Venetia was the capital for a little bit, but then, you know, as things really worked out, the capital moves to Sacramento. Sacramento is uh, very fun in the sense that of its naming, in the sense that it's, uh, it's that Spanish name. It's the sacraments, you know. This is the, uh, uh, the uh, holy sacraments, you know. This is, this is what it's named after and named by the Spanish because they just loved it. But then, you know, it gets overrun with the gold rush. And Sacramento, and we'll talk about this, this is a floodplain in the center. It's lots and lots of water. And it all flows up and down into this huge floodplain. And, uh, and then it comes out the delta and everything into the, the, the bay here. And so, so massive amounts of water all come flowing through here. And that's, uh, South Sacramento has a very interesting history. But it's the power center of California. The population center moves up here, ceases to be in Monterey, ceases to be in Los Angeles. And down here, we're pretty isolated. Mountains coming here, mountains here and here. And then, therefore, you have this sort of very distinct Northern California, Northern Southern California setup. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about is just, is that when the United States conquered, uh, they did so on the basis of uh, believing that they themselves were doing this in the right. Uh, there's a lot of weird justifications for that, but, but they did write a good treaty. And why by a good treaty, uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, it promised that the conquered peoples, the Mexicans, um, us, you know, we were conquered, would actually be treated extremely well. We would not lose our land. We would be brought in as citizens. We would become fully participating in the system. And in fact, with the Constitution and convention in 1850, we have a lot of participation by people who were formerly Mexicans, people who had been here before, uh, people of Spanish and Mexican heritage, who then, part, uh, you know, like the Delaguerra, uh, son Pablo, uh, and I think there's a Pico, that's Andres Pico, I think is there, and there's a, you know, just these people are showing up, and so there's this, you know, what could have been a good feeling, what could have been a good Good treaty, good takeover. But here again, the gold rush sort of wipes through uh, this, uh, any, any sort of hopes for goodness and, and uh, stability. And so, uh, you know, that happens. But in that first legislature in 1851, uh, you get uh, the act for the ascertain and sell private land claims of the state of California. The goal is to, we, we told the Mexican people that we are Mexican Californios, that we are going to let them keep their land. So all they need to do is prove that they own that land. Well, that becomes big problematic sort of thing. And, and I give you as an example what happens on Santa Catalina Island. Santa Catalina Island is a rancho and a very distinct water-bound boundary. So there's no question about its water boundaries or all this other sort of stuff and it was uh, in 1846 was granted to Thomas Robbins who was married into the Carrillo family one of those uh, Americans who had moved here uh, uh, by Pio Pico now that's flurry of land grants that was happened right at the end right in 18, 1846 is when you you know the, the war starts and uh, so uh, I don't know the ins and outs of this, but the thing is that even Thomas Robbins has, has got to got to sort of feel like I could lose the ownership of this land. He's got a deed to it. So he sells his property to uh, Covarrubias, and he sells it in 1850, sort of, you know, this 1851. So, you know, he's not sure he's going to... Covarrubias... Okay, uh, Frenchman turned Mexican citizen, came here in 1834, one of these many colonizing people, marries into a Carrillo family, that Carrillo's got a lot of daughters, he's all called a mayor of Santa Barbara, so he's a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, so if anyone's going to get to keep their land, it's 
Covarrubias, okay, and so Covarrubias, Robins, these are up, these are not like minor league folks. These are folks that are deeply embedded, and why shouldn't they be able to hold on to his land? Well, the trouble is, Covarrubias has got to hire lawyers, you know, to go through all this work, and then uh, uh, in 1866, okay, so this is 18, when did he buy it? He bought it in uh, 50. So 16 years later, he's finally told that, yes, in fact, you do own that island. It's your rancho. Huh. But he had spent so much on lawyers and everything else uh, to try and get this, uh, that he's got to dump the property. Okay, So that's how a lot of the Mexican, great Mexican landowners lost their land. It was not because it was like taken away or something, it was a lot because of lawyer fees and all sorts of stuff. They made the process hard. You're supposed to get this land, but we make it hard. A lot of people, a lot of individual people, small landowners, you know, a little plot here, you know, they, they got their land, it all worked out fine. A lot of them didn't because, because some big, you know, new landowner would come in and swipe it or something like that. This is a mess, it's a mess. But uh, basically, the high hopes of Frida Guadalupe Hidalgo to keep things calm and to be generous turn out to not be calm and not be generous. And so that's what, what we have in that situation. And so um, I'm going to end it there. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, what happens with the Indians. But, but keep in mind, this California, so the power has moved up into this region here. Down here becomes a very isolated place uh, for another 20 years or so. We'll talk about that until the 1880s when it really starts to grow again. And then it'll eventually become dominant, you know, Southern California. But, but these, this valley up here is where, where a lot of the, the real rough and tumble stuff is going on.